Okay, good. And I'll try and keep that under 10 minutes. Good, and I think I'll then speak okay. about the events that are coming up as well as my first piece of research, which hopefully contextualizes what we're doing. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Chris, is there any way you can stay a little bit farther away from your camera? You're too close to your camera, yeah. Farther away? Sounds yeah. Good. Yeah, uh, maybe a little bit closer, but that's, uh, is that, can you turn down your camera a little bit? So cut off, you have too much headroom. Yeah, then, then you can stay away a little bit. Yeah, like that, that's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, yeah, we're at 3.31. Uh, so you are ready and set to go anytime. We are live on YouTube and on Zoom, so. Okay, so welcome everyone to the first event in the visit of Dr. John Boros, the virtual visit to the University of Alberta. Um, this visit is sponsored by the Distinguished Visitors Fund, which is located in the office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation at the University of Alberta. We have technical support today from the Arts Resource Center in the Faculty of Arts in the form of Blair Peters and Grant Wang. And I'd like to thank um, Annette and uh, Diane Johnson in the Department of English for their help in publicizing and doing finances. I'll begin with a territorial acknowledgement. And then I'm actually going to use the territorial acknowledgement to introduce John and his work. Um, the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Um, that's actually the University of Alberta's mandated statement, which interestingly appears on the university webpage under University Relations, Brand, and Communications. So, I'm going to start by asking why I read this acknowledgement rather than others, because if you know me, then you know I read everything all the time. I was struck in reviewing this statement because it actually shows the impact of John's work, especially that last clause which I raised and tried to emphasize with my voice. Um, to repeat, the university statement acknowledges First Peoples whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I think in the context of a statement on treaties, territory and title, the affirmation of the living presence of indigenous people is a response to John's well-known criticism of roughly 20 years ago of the assumption in Canadian law and culture, settler Canadian law and culture, that indigenous rights are frozen rights. And his satire of the assumptions underlying this prejudice, which as he argued 20 years ago, relegated Indigenous development to the distant past. I really think it was John who made institutions careful about the way they speak and about the way they speak about history and time. So in acknowledging the continuing presence of Indigenous people, we're also, I think, acknowledging the continuing impact of John's work and his influence on us. So I'll proceed now to a bio of John and then I'll say a few words about why this visit, which I've been planning really since last September, I guess. John Burroughs is Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria. Um, he's also held positions at a number of other universities, so this information might interest you, such as the University of Minnesota, um, the University of Toronto, the University of British Columbia, and Osgood Hall Law School at York University. John's many influential publications include Recovering Canada, The Resurgence of Indigenous Law, which is kind of a good starting place, I think, and has influenced my intro today. It won the Donald Smiley Award for Best Book in Canadian Political Science in 2002. Other titles include Canada's Indigenous Constitution, also won an award in 2011, Drawing Out Law, The Spirit's Guide in 2010, Freedom and Indigenous Constitutionalism, which won the Smiley Award again 
in 2016. And Laws, Indigenous Ethics, which was acknowledged as best subsequent book by NASA in 2020. He's also co-edited several volumes and published many, many papers. Among other honors, uh, John was the 2017 Killam Prize winner in social sciences and the 2019 Molson Prize winner from the Canada Council for the Arts. He was the 2020 winner of the Governor General's Innovation Award. John is a member of the Chippewas of the Nawash First Nation, which is located in Georgian Bay, which as you all know is in Lake Huron in Northwesternish Ontario, as we now call it. So why this visit? That's John's bio. Um, if you want more information on him, more is available. A good source is his own website at the University of Victoria. Why this visit and why invite John to speak to us from a department of literature, right? Why did this invitation come from an English department? We'll go back 20 years when John argued that Canadian law is in fact an amalgam of different legal orders. And he affirmed the principles of law cannot, can in fact coexist without conflict, which was a way of affirming the similarities between legal orders. Indigenous rights arise from traditional laws and practices, he argues, and he adds that sources of Indigenous legal principles include stories, narrative, literature. Stories express law and are central to normative legal structures. One strength of this approach, he has argued, is the reinterpretation of tradition to meet contemporary needs and contexts. The danger of freezing oral tradition, I already mentioned in commenting on the acknowledgement. Um, John affirms that Indigenous people review historical experiences and cultural epics to formulate and apply their own law. So this for me is the great connection and the great opportunity in this visit, this relationship between what we call law and what we call literature. Um, John has affirmed that Indigenous legal principles can be accepted by analogy into Canadian law because cross-fertilization is already built into the common law. So he looks for areas of commonality. He stresses the difficulty of acquiring knowledge in this area though, or at least he did 20 years ago, which as he wrote in 22, tends to become a personal quest. Um, he affirmed then that the acquisition of knowledge in law is neither magical nor mystical, but requires years of study and hard work. Um, when he wrote this, I think at the time he seemed to be sending a strong signal to schools and universities and law schools in particular about perhaps the way um, education needed to be reformed. John also affirms that settings for the implementation of law extend beyond formal institutions of Canadian law to less formal settings, such as the family, interfamily relationships and the community generally. One of the issues that John raises in his work is how legal systems might have to change or transform themselves to accommodate each other. And indeed he affirms that the common law might have to be reframed. And intriguingly for me anyway, and I think for us, I hope, um, the common law might have to include a different approach towards liter the literary, the poetic and narrative. And my question, and the question I guess guiding the visit, one question anyway, is are we ready for that? Are we in Settler Canada ready for this transformation? Um, often uh, members of settler society refer to indigenous rights claims as somehow irrational or a nuisance rather than an opportunity for self-transformation. And my other question is, are we ready after so many decades of devaluing literary study which is really coming to a crescendo right now, are we ready institutionally? And are we ready um, in our educational backgrounds, in our educational disciplinary formations? One thing that will be necessary, John argues, is the overcoming of a non-Aboriginal characterization of Aboriginality, as he put it in Recovering Canada. A non-Aboriginal characterization of Aboriginal Aboriginality Evidence Law and Literature, one he detected in the Supreme Court of Canada's decisions on rights in the 1990s. 
Back then, the Supreme Court set out a discourse of conformity to Western standards rather than a project for mutual translation and transformation. This would mean overcoming the topos of frozen development, which I mentioned already, which relegates indigenous development to the distant past, foreclosing growth and change. Um, reconciliation for John requires concessions and transformation on both sides. A more promising basis, he argued, would be the recognition of ancestral laws and customs and their development and through the interaction um, with the federal crown. Just to wrap up this introduction, I'll briefly outline my interest here so that you know where I'm at. It seems to me one of the standards that will have to come under challenge if we agree that reconciliation requires mutual transformation will be the concept of the literary or what I prefer to call the poetic. As I've argued for years, the poetic in what we vaguely call the Western European tradition or Western European metaphysics or Platonism is already a racialized concept and it's already defined within a racialized hierarchy. At the very moment that John is affirming stories as sources of law, we're living within the de devaluation of the poetic and of narrative. And reorganizing institutions of learning, such as this one, around classical anti-poetic prejudices, which are simultaneously racial prejudices in disguise. So that is my introduction of John and my own mission statement for this visit. Now I'm gonna turn you over to John and I think he will do everything differently. Uh, introducing myself and my thanks for this invitation, uh, and uh, look forward to an opportunity to talk with and visit with and interact with you, Christopher, and others as we're here together over this week. This is a series of visits that I'll be engaging with, and this is just introductions today, as you've outlined. Uh, I really like your question about the moment of readiness. And I think that uh, we're going to have some good discussion about that as we're uh, with one another through our time together. And so I hope we keep coming back to that. And you asked me pointedly and tangentially um, uh, whether or not we are ready for Indigenous law and story and uh, standards and, and ways as a part of our, our, our relationality that is mutually transformative in a positive way as opposed to what we've been living through, which is uh, um, marginalizing and, and impoverished uh, in many different registers. But I do wanna introduce myself further uh, before uh, we maybe have a little bit more of a conversation here. And I'm gonna share some slides here just for that purpose. Um, so uh, let me go back to the beginning here. So, this is where I'm from in terms of my family. It's the Cape Croker Indian Reserve. It's in Ontario, as Christopher mentioned, on the shores of Georgian Bay. This is what it looks like this year, and I wish I could be there. Um, this is the first time I've not been home to the reserve in over a year because of the pandemic, and I'm missing uh, home uh, quite strongly. Uh, my sister and mother uh, live there. Uh, my father passed away uh, about a year before the pandemic. And uh, so a longing is in my heart uh, for uh, this beautiful space. Uh, but I'm grateful I'm safe, and I'm grateful uh, my sister and mother have received their vaccines. Uh, my mother had a stroke over the past uh, few months, and it's been hard not to be with them because of uh, that uh, as well. Uh, but there's great beauty, and she uh, lost her speech and has recovered her speech. And I look forward to getting together with her. Um, I'm speaking to you from Wasanich territory, which is what's now uh, called Victoria. Um, the Sanchothan speaking people live here of the Sartlip and uh, Sekum and Paquichin and um, um, uh, Sekum uh, reserves. And it's wonderful to be in this area, uh, learning uh, with people, say out reserves, I mean. It's wonderful to be in this area. Uh, the Douglas treaties are here. 
I, I live and learn and work amongst these uh, people, and I learn a lot about law uh, from them, including stories about their first ancestors, which is rain. And you can imagine uh, being on the West Coast, how significant that is uh, in relationship to um, their origins. Um, there's also the um, um, Lekwungen speaking peoples that uh, are here and the Songhees and Esquimalt nations are uh, also good hosts and uh, Dr. Skip Dick often uh, takes uh, that role of acknowledgement that Christopher uh, did at the beginning of our time together and it's so gracious of him to be able to express the need for gratitude and welcome and so I want to express my appreciation for being here on this territory. Nigegan Dodem, I'm from the Otter clan, and so here's my family. Here's who I'm related to. Our creation story uh, places us in relationship to the animals, and uh, I don't have time to talk about it right now, but maybe I will somewhere along the way. Uh, but when the, the first giant otter passed, um, the uh, otter people uh, arose from his carcass, just as when the, the giant bear or beaver or uh, caribou passed, um, the clans uh, came from um, that ancestor. And so this is my relation, Nigig in Dodem. Uh, Ododeman, um, Ode is our word for heart. Uh, Dodem or totem, as it's often called, is where we uh, attach our heart, where we find our heart. It's related uh, to this, uh, this um, family, this kinship uh, that uh, we are in a literal uh, and metaphorical relationship with. Um, I'm from the Cape Croker Indian Reserve, or Neashiwiningaming, and there's the area pointing to it. It's about three hours uh, north of uh, Toronto on the Saugeen or the Bruce Peninsula, and about four hours north of Detroit. And uh, you can see it's there in the Eastern Great Lakes. And um, the language that I introduced myself in is Ojibwe or Chippewa, Anishinaabe Moin. It's a part of a large Algonquian language family that is uh, down in the um, United States uh, with uh, Passamaquoddy and um, Abenaki, and, and then into Canada where there's also Passamaquoddy, Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, um, Wallastokwiak, um, um, Inu, Cree, Potawatomi, uh, Odawa, uh, cross uh, into um, the Plains Cree, out to the Blackfoot people at the foot of the Rocky Mountains there in uh, southern Alberta. It's a broad language family. There's a couple of other um, Algonquian uh, groups. Uh, the Cheyenne of the, the Mid Plains in the United States are Algonquian, and there's two Algonquian speaking groups on, uh, in Northern California. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an East-West uh, language family, and that's uh, where I'm from. Here's the territory more uh, in uh, focus, and you can see uh, my reserve there is at this place. Um, there's another reserve that's our sister reserve across the way called the Saugeen uh, First Nation. Um, and you can see we're surrounded by the uh, waters of Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. And this is our, our treaty territory. In 1836, a treaty was made from Godrich to Arthur, north there to Collingwood. Um, that's, that's my traditional territory. And it's a, a beautiful area of um, limestone escarpments that rise out of the waters. Um, as you know, Niagara Falls uh, cuts uh, through the backbone of Ontario before disappearing here under Lake uh, um, Huron and then rising again in Manitoulin going across Manitoulin and, and then actually down into Wisconsin, Green Bay, uh, Wisconsin, where it seems to uh, terminate. So that's uh, my clan, and this is my territory, um, and this is uh, my family. Um, this is my third great uncle. His name is Tecumseh, uh, Tecumoseh. Uh, Ose is the word for walk. Tecum is, is uh, actually to walk across, and he did that in his life as he walked across uh, the eastern part of the continent from what is now Ontario uh, down into Florida, trying to bring First Nations into alliance with one another to resist the challenge of um, the, um, the rising um, United States of America and created a, a relationship of uh, peace and friendship and respect with the British 
and became allied along with the British against uh, the, um, the United States of America and fought and lost his life eventually in the War of 1812. He, um, like I said, is my great, great uncle, but it's uh, through marriage. Uh, he married a woman named Wasega Boa, and Wasega Boa is um, my um, third great grandfather's sister, and his name is Giganos, and Giganos is the name that I carry. So when I introduced myself, I said Giganos Nindijnakas, Neyashi Wadigaming in Dodenjaba, Nigigan Dodem. So I let you know my clan, where I'm from, and uh, my, what my name is. Uh, and his name, Giganos, that third great grandfather, um, Gigado is our word to speak in Anishinaabe Moim. And Ons is the diminutive of. So he was the little speaker. Uh, or in other words, he was a speaker that was charged with remembering what took place in council and then pulling the remembrance of that into other councils. And so that was the role that he had within the community. And that's the role that my mother um, passed along to me as a part of uh, my uh, growing up. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sharing this now for another reason, which is um, this is related to the first piece of research that I ever did, which uh, was my LLM or my master's research, which was called a genealogy of law that looked at seven generations of my family history the challenges that we received in relationship to the Canadian state uh, or the British or the American state, and then what we did to uh, be resilient in the face of that. So here's the next generation. This is um, a Peter Giganos Jones there on the right. And then on the left are the works of my great, great grandmother, Margaret McLeod. So let me explain about them. Here on the right, or sorry, on the, yeah, the right, is that right? <laughs> the left, actually, Peter Giganos Jones is uh, um, wearing medals around his uh, neck. He entered into a treaty dealing with 1.5 million acres of land in Ontario and putting his otter signature, Dodem, on that treaty, welcoming people to come and live in accordance with our laws. And he received a, a medal from Victor uh, Queen Victoria for doing that. Another medal is around his neck because he rescued a surveyor out of the bush who was uh, in great distress and likely to perish around Markdale, Ontario. And then he received um, the uh, uh, recognition for doing that. Um, he also fought in the Mackenzie Rebellion in 1837 in Ontario, and he was a chief of our community. On the other side of the page there, Tales of Nokomis, these are stories from my uh, second great grandmother, Margaret McLeod, and they're told uh, to her uh, ancestor, Verna Patronella Johnson. And um, when Verna wrote the preface to this book, uh, she said that she heard these stories from my great great grandmother, and that her great, my, my great great grandmother said that they came from her great 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 uh, grandparents. Uh, so, in other words, um, the stories that are recorded here go at least five, six uh, generations back, and uh, there are stories about how we should live with one another. They are our stories of law, as Christopher was talking about. Um, and so the tradition of treaties uh, was passed down to me through this great, great uh, grandfather. And this, this tradition of stories was passed down to me through this great, great grandmother. Now she, uh, Margaret McLeod, was actually uh, born um, uh, to a mother whose name was Teresa Riel. And her father was Joseph McLeod. And so you've got Peter here being dressed as a Métis person uh, because she comes from a McLeod, um, a Riel line, uh, but she married into uh, the Chippewa of the Nawash or our folks at Neyashi and, uh, and so therefore you've got this interesting blending of worlds between Métis and Anishinaabe that continues to be Anishinaabe, but has this uh, wonderful um, work that comes in uh, through that uh, mingling and mixing. This is my great uh, grandfather. His name is Charles Giganos Jones. Um, he was a hereditary leader in our community, serving on council as both chief and councillor for over 50 years. He was the most significant figure in my young uh, mother's life. Uh, he was a very loving person. And um, he was a very strong person too. When he was 100 years old, he walked in uh, uh, from the bush carrying a deer around his neck. 
Um, you can imagine how heavy a deer is and how much strength you would have to have at 100 uh, to be able to do that. Uh, beautiful, uh, honorable uh, person. Um, here's uh, some of their relations that uh, they uh, married, and you can see their pictures there um, in different eras. Um, this is the grandfather that I have, uh, uh, Josh Jones, sitting outside the old family cabin at uh, Cape Croker with my sister beside him. Uh, Josh uh, was a character. Um, he um, um, was a rum runner uh, during the Prohibition era and uh, ferried liquor back and forth between Detroit and Windsor in that time. Indians couldn't drink at that time under the Indian Act. And so this was a real uh, effort uh, that he took to do this. He also I received an honorary doctorate from the University of Kentucky because of his knowledge of plants, because that uh, uh, my great great grandmother not only was a storyteller, she was a medicine woman and we have uh, her medicine uh, uh, tradition passed along. And, uh, and so he knew about those plants. Um, likewise, uh, he was a Hollywood Indian. He went to uh, Hollywood in the 1930s and participated uh, in that uh, silent film era. And uh, he was part of a union called the First Americans, uh, which were all indigenous peoples um, that would speak their language with one another and they would organize in relationship to what was happening in Hollywood at that time. But when they bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, he packed up his family, Grapes of Wrath style, and made his way back to uh, Ontario. Uh, my mother was born in California, but she came back to well, came to the reserve uh, at age four and has spent a lot of her life and last uh, 30 years of her life on the reserve there. And here she is, uh, my mother, um, a powerful, a amazing woman with great knowledge of uh, stories again and an attentive to, attentiveness to the natural world. And I feel like uh, those ancestors that I've been showing you were able to pass on to me some of that information uh, because of, of her, um, her knowledge and her abilities. And there, of course, I am in her arms as a young boy uh, coming into the world, uh, fresh uh, faced uh, and, uh, and appreciative of that connection. Now here's uh, my daughter, uh, Gigata, uh, Lindsay. Uh, she's got her jingle dress on there with this beautiful brett. Um, and she's um, um, an amazing storyteller herself. She published a book about Indigenous law and language revitalization called Otter's Journeys. And there's a lot of stories that are found in her book that are connected to the stories that I've been telling you. And then I have another daughter here. Her name is Chik Chik Chigadase, uh, which is uh, the word for chickadee. And, um, and she is a fantastic uh, uh, young uh, woman. And then now I've got a son-in-law here, uh, Sean Ritchie. And then I've now got a granddaughter who's almost two years old. Her name is Wisea, which means shining, bright, and clear. And uh, that's a family name as well. It comes from my second great uh, grandmother, who was also a medicine woman and also a story uh, teller. And so it's great to be able to see these things uh, work their way through the generation. I just want to pause just before I, I finish here and make note that uh, this was my first publication, A Genealogy of Law, Inherent Sovereignty and First Nations Self-Government, again, stemming from my master's uh, thesis and uh, published in the Osgoode Hall Law Journal in 1992. And you can see uh, just by this um, table of contents that what I tried to do was go through these generations and look at the different challenges we faced through the generations and, uh, and say how we've preserved our autonomy, our agency, our ability to access our own laws, governance and legal traditions. So from things like war and religion, uh, through healthcare and language and education, through uh, being away from uh, Nawash, then going back to Nawash, entering into treaties, and then uh, the self-governance issues as a result of the Indian Act and the great pressure that that Indian Act placed on us, but nevertheless did not destroy the ability that we have to look to our own normativity to try to create a path, path forward. And, and I think uh, what I hope to do in this time we have together over this week is develop some of the things that I've learned uh, from those early days that connect back to that beautiful land 
uh, to my clan, to those stories, to that experience uh, that I have and my ancestors have to talk about things like uh, freedom and indigenous constitutionalism, which is the symposium that uh, will be uh, taking place tomorrow at the same time. And uh, really talking about one of my books as a result of uh, that, uh, which is here, this freedom and indigenous uh, uh, constitutionalism book that was published in 2016. And then uh, the next day on Wednesday, talk about law, story and dream, indigenous uh, uh, legal traditions and narrative focus. And I published a book in 2010 that Christopher mentioned called Drawing Out Law, A Spirit's Guide that uh, is written in, in a story format. It's, a, um, it's not a linear uh, structure. And at the beginning of each uh, chapter, there, there's a scroll that's there, which is our way of engaging with literacy. But perhaps there's some of the poetics in uh, this as well that Christopher was talking about, because they're related to dreams, uh, many of these stories that are told within this book. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, Louise Erdrich's Roundhouse um, on uh, uh, the 11th, and that will be a seminar with the graduate students. And I really look forward to having that conversation. When Louise was writing this book, I was teaching at the University of Minnesota, and she shared a draft copy of the book with me. I was able to read it in that form, and I don't want to claim anything for myself, but uh, the interaction there certainly informed me and I think uh, she was informed by something I passed along uh, to her, which is from one of your colleagues, uh, LLM thesis, Hadley Friedland, uh, about Wendigos. And, uh, and so the Wendigo theme that Hadley developed in her um, LLM, uh, I think came a little bit more strongly through in this book uh, as a result of me being able to uh, learn so much, of course, from Louise. She's the brilliant genius, but just giving her a, a source or two about some of the interesting work that was happening around us. So look forward to that conversation. And then we have a, a town and gown event. Uh, this is on Thursday, again, the 11th. We'll be talking about laws, indigenous ethics. And uh, that uh, is that recent book that um, um, Christopher was talking about. And I look forward to having a conversation uh, around that. And then finally, on the Friday, uh, talking about writing from an Indigenous, uh, right, so writing as an Indigenous practice. And you can see behind me uh, some of this as I've worked with uh, artists in relationship to some of the books that uh, I've, uh, I've published. And uh, you can see other forms of expression that are, are, are poetics, are writing that might not necessarily always find their way uh, to this kind of a, um, a register, but nevertheless are about people reflecting and, and passing along um, their, their dreams, their hopes, their aspirations, their research, their observations. And so that's a bit of an introduction to myself in about 20 minutes or so maybe uh, just to set the stage uh, for what we're doing. And uh, I'm grateful for this invitation. I'm grateful to be able to speak at um, the University of Alberta. My daughter is currently doing her LLM at the University of Alberta in the law school. And so I felt extra um, appreciation uh, that I would receive uh, this invitation and um, look forward to uh, the time that we'll have together. Thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction and especially the audio visuals. Um, I suppose I would open, uh, open discussion to the floor. There is no floor to the virtual floor. I would invite people to pose any questions they might have at this point. Part of the uh, purpose of this meeting is um, simply when we were discussing this meeting back in the fall, of this visit really, um, I kind of thought I had no idea what was going to happen or how a virtual visit would work so that we needed some kind of brief introductory session to get people oriented and to explain um, how the events would work. I do have to announce that my original idea was that there would be a pre-recorded element to all of this, there would be pre-recorded lectures 
Well, to quote Eden Robinson, ha bloody ha. Um, it didn't work out. We weren't very happy with the results. And in retrospect, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought somehow it would increase participation because I have the ever present Zoom fatigue on my mind when I'm planning. So no, contrary to all previous advertising, there will be no, um, there will be no pre-recordings. All of these will be live events, which I now think will be much better. Uh, finally, there will be online office hours. These will be from 1 to 1.50 on Wednesday and Friday, the 10th and the 12th. Um, if you want to join, then I would suggest emailing me and I'm about to post my email address. Email me and I'll send you a link. If you want to join John during office hours at these times, that's 1 to 1.50 on Wednesday and Friday afternoons. Now, if anyone has uh, questions or comments. As you're thinking about a question, I can anticipate one perhaps, which is um, how did I do this research that I've just described to you? Um, well, I went home and uh, talked to my great aunt and great uncle and sat at their kitchen table for many hours hearing from them the story of that genealogy that went through time and uh, getting lots of specifics in that regard. And my aunt and my mother came along with me. And so there was uh, often four or five of us that would be gathered around a kitchen table, table having this discussion so that they would uh, prompt one another and, uh, and uh, recognize that uh, the, the conversations can't just be unidirectional. And then after we did this uh, with all of these uh, um, visits, then I went to the archive and uh, pieced through the archive to see whether or not I could find a connection to what they were talking about. And uh, I was really grateful for their orientation because it was like a puzzle piece um, that I found in the archive and I didn't know, I wouldn't have known what to do with that piece of the puzzle had I not had a picture that had been painted for me uh, by uh, my great aunt and great uncle, uncle Fred and Irene. And so then when, you know, a little piece would emerge in the archive, I could sort of figure out where that uh, might fit or if there was something that was suspicious about the archive because of the way it had been recorded. And another uh, piece is my mother would take me out on the land and she would describe to me uh, many of the places that these events uh, were taking place, including, I can remember, standing on the shores of the Saugeen River right near um, Lake Huron. And she said, I want you to hug this tree. <laughs> and I said, what? I was like a 25-year-old man. She says, no, I want you to appreciate this tree. It was an old, old uh, maple tree. And she said, I want you to do this because you know it will have seen generations of uh, our ancestors come and go. And so, you know, I kind of reluctantly embraced the tree, a little embarrassed, but, uh, you know, being a, a good boy and wanting to listen to my mother. And uh, so I did. And then when I was in the archives later on, I discovered that place where that tree was, was called Chief's Point after my uh, third great grandfather, because that's where he brought people out during the War of 1812 up the coast beyond Gardrich uh, towards the Southampton area to keep uh, the young people and those who were vulnerable away from the theater of war. And so what she did there was actually cement in my mind the importance of that place so that you know, when I was looking, uh, I, I think it, I became more receptive to uh, what was, was happening as a result. And so the, it, was, it was oral history research, lots of stories, uh, and then with those stories going out into other places and trying to figure out how I might correlate these two things together. Okay, we have a question on chat uh, from April Gladu. Can you please comment on the challenges and opportunities in bringing your knowledge? Oops, I just lost it. <laughs> My computer just uh, 
put something in front of my face so I can't read the message. Okay, there it's gone. Thank you, computer. Can you please comment on the challenges and opportunities of bringing your rich knowledge and stories into mainstream academic and legal? This is from Yasmin Abu Laban. There's another question before that, was there? I'll ask that, I'll answer that question first, perhaps. So the challenge and opportunity are many, as, as Christopher uh, identified, um, is the world ready for stories from Indigenous peoples to form law? And in first, in fact, my first three or four months of being in the master's program, I had a vision of what a, a law thesis would look like. And you can imagine it was a pretty conventional imaginary that, um, viewed that I had to cite lots of cases and lots of uh, legislation and then analyze the relationship between the cases and the legislation. And I recognized uh, after starting to talk to my great aunt and great uncle that I was self-censoring, <laughs> that I was only seeing law through a Western lens of uh, statutes and cases. And what they were teaching me was that law comes from people's interactions, functionally setting standards and principles and criteria and measures and signposts and guidance by the lessons that are found in the language and found in the story. And so um, when I made that breakthrough, the um, thesis came pretty quickly after that, but the biggest challenge was my own lack of imagination, my own self-censorship that a, a thesis had to look uh, like a certain thing. And, uh, and so that, uh, that was one piece. And then of course, when I went to uh, publish it more generally and put it out in the world. I, st I still had to explain what I was doing as law uh, as, as, because most of my colleagues would think of law as, as more institutionally generated by courts or legislatures. Uh, but having said that, there was another opportunity, which is in 1992, the court, uh, sorry, 1990, the court for the first time um, uh, passed an Aboriginal rights case or, or made an Aboriginal rights case. And I was writing in 1990, 1991. And they said that just because a right was regulated in great detail didn't mean it was extinguished. So just because there was lots of writing from legislatures and the executive over top of Aboriginal rights didn't mean the thing underneath it was extinguished. And I thought, there's an opportunity. I can talk about how underneath what we're doing all along is our own stuff and people are trying to overwrite it, uh, but um, it's not extinguishment. And so that, uh, that opened up a space of opportunity for me to understand that the courts might have some space there for recognizing that the source of law isn't the legislature, isn't the courts itself, but it's those pre-existing uh, indigenous uh, um, relationalities and poetics, as Christopher talked about, that survived the assertion of uh, crown sovereignty. And uh, though they've been put upon, uh, as my thesis explained, they were never extinguished. We were resilient in the face of those things. We were active agents not just passive victims. And so that is, uh, I think that challenge there uh, that I faced, uh, self-censorship and would anyone recognize that? But then there was also an opportunity created because the courts uh, said, well, um, in fact, indigenous law isn't created by Canada. It's created by indigenous peoples themselves. So that was the opening I needed to start prying things open a little bit wider in the subsequent work I was doing. Thanks. So, um, okay, I can finally read my computer now. <laughs> I've been doing this for a year. I still can't do it. Um, there's a question about resistance. I think this was the first question that came up on chat. Can you talk about resistance in the form of poetry, literature, legal writing, and whether you think resistance is needed more than ever now, or also how best to do that resistance? I do love that question because the favorite stories that I received when I was uh, doing my research were trickster stories, uh, Nana Bojo. And if you know anything about the trickster, he's simultaneously harmful and helpful, kind and cunning, uh, charming and plays uh, mean tricks. And, and so within that tradition, 
is uh, understanding of uh, resistance and, and contrast and complexity and the danger of a single story and the need for nuance as uh, you try to put uh, various things together. And they're not always possible to be reconciled, that you have to just be prepared to hold things in two hands and say, well, why did he do this? And what happened over here? And you're, you're left with that contrast that uh, provides uh, a space for engagement and also a space for uh, resistance, not doing things uh, the same way that they were done before. And so I learn a lot about uh, resistance uh, from our trickster characters uh, and from uh, those that told me uh, about uh, the trickster because of the way they uh, lived their lives, trying to occupy that space that wasn't filling other people's expectation as they would always hope, but they were doing something a bit new, a bit different uh, because of the way they combined um, the, the forces that would come together uh, through, through that engagement. So yeah, that is so powerful, but it also means that there's spaces for engagement as well as not just talking about resistance. They, they can be simultaneously present. It's not an either or possibility, it's like and. And, and the trickster is sometimes very engaging and, and does things that are quite helpful and quite um, uh, uh, welcome uh, by the community. And does and of course the trickster is a transformer too, right? Not just transforms uh, from a, like a, a frog to a rock, to a person, to a buffalo, but then also transforms the setting, uh, the scene, the characters, the plot, uh, twists and turns uh, take place uh, there in uh, that, uh, those set of stories. And of course, there's a, a huge law in politics within that for Anishinaabe and other Indigenous peoples who think about uh, the, those stories and how they can uh, um, mean that uh, we just don't have to take one approach to the work that we do. We can maybe ourselves occupy that space of the trickster, even though as we do that, we're as likely to get burned ourselves <laughs> because we can't just think that we're gonna be free of the, uh, uh, the unintended consequences, the things that we don't foresee, where sometimes we think we're putting something out there in the world that's good. And in fact, it can be quite harmful or compromising. And, 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 and so that is another lesson uh, that I take from uh, trying to work with resistance. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, another question on John. Um, this question came up while you were saying something. With mother who shows plants and shares stories um, in the process, how much can and do our personal relationality to the land and stories we hear or tell inform the ways we navigate the academy and the courts? Like, is there um, a room for the personal story in these heavy institutions? Yeah, you know, sometimes in Western parlance, we think about law as being something that's done to you, that's an external force. And, uh, and, it's not just that simple, but that's how we might think about it. Um, and, and usually we teach that uh, form in law schools um, that you're applying yourself to something that's out there um, that you're constantly working against or critiquing or, or, or analogizing as the case might be. Uh, but for uh, at least a big part of the Anishinaabe legal tradition, is it something that you're meant to carry around inside you and see it as a part of yourself? And so the question here about uh, someone's mother taking them and showing them the plants and sharing the stories as they hiked around Cold Lake and Espanola, that's very familiar to me uh, because uh, what I think is happening there is, is you're participating in the interpretation of law, what these plants mean, as you take action in relationship to them, the uh, work of law in that site. And so uh, the personal and the relationality is, uh, is a big part of uh, learning uh, Anishinaabe law. And so we'll talk about this in a later lecture, maybe the Laws Indigenous Ethics lecture, 
on uh, Thursday evening. We do a lot of land-based education where we take uh, law students out to like my reserve. And uh, we have uh, hear stories by walking along the path and pointing to the plants and eating the berries and participating with elders and, and trying to find uh, that connection. Now, what does that do with the, how does, how does that relate to the academy? I think I've just uh, given a possible answer there. Um, the, the academy shouldn't just be about our walls and our offices and our classrooms, uh, but we should engage with the wider world. And then how does that engage with the courts was trying to help the courts to see that they aren't the only authorities, right? It's not to take away from the respect that uh, could be due there, but it's just to recognize that it doesn't take any way, thing away from them uh, to show that there's other sites of, uh, of interpretation that are normative, that are obligatory, uh, that pass along um, what we call law. And so um, I love the question because I think that's what we're trying to do here at the University of Victoria. We have a joint degree in Indigenous law and the common law, first of its kind in the world, it's now in its third year of operation, is trying to have the students work transystemically, learn from the academy, learn from the courts, but then also learn more relationally uh, from field schools. I take the students outside quite frequently uh, when we're not in COVID and I will use my drum or I'll talk in the language, I'm not fluent, but I'll talk enough to be able to share some messages there or um, you know, uh, share a story or something like that. So it's a good point. And it's one of the themes that will be engaged uh, over this week as I'm in this virtual visit with everyone here. Did I see that Rob had raised his hand? If uh, you could speak. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, I decided to raise my hand in the spirit of uh, some reciprocity and to turn my camera on. Um, so thanks for uh, kind of being here with us. Um, my my question is is maybe a bit daft, but is a larger thematic question. Um, and as I'm looking forward to your visit, um, I'm wondering if you might speak to sort of three large kind of terms that have come up um, and just a little bit of a primer on how you see the relationship between them, those being um, ethics, uh, poetics, and law as three intertwined, but maybe from my perspective, also divergent ways of thinking about social relations? Um, That's a great question. And um, let me just take a first cut at this now, and then I'll keep reflecting on your question as we go through our visits together. Um, but my first uh, reflection is that Anishinaabemwin is an 80% verb-based language. Algonquian languages are 80% verb-based. And so when you're in the world of verbs, you're into conjugations. And so there's not the same kind of insistence on the categorizations that nouns might hold. And so, you know, the, the distinction between poetics and uh, law and ethics, if you're talking as nouns, uh, you know, can be quite significant. But if you start to put things into a, a verb-based uh, possibility, you can suddenly inflect it uh, in many different ways by mashing words together, uh, like pre prefixes and suffixes, um, tenses, uh, um, um, uh, reciprocality. Um, there's, there's just so many uh, possibilities uh, that, that are, are, are present there. So it's not that I, I'm trying to duck the distinctions between poetics and law and ethics. There definitely uh, need to make distinctions between uh, different modes, different ways. But I also guess I'm saying is let's not be too um, precise if we're going to be working in a verb-based, uh, uh, at least, um, uh, frame um, so that we might be able to think about what are the relationship between those things as well. And so maybe that's just my initial answer. I want to be uh, able to think about their distinctions and I'll, I'll work with that with you but I also want to be able to think about their relationships and uh, maybe we'll go back and forth between nouns and verbs here along the way. Uh, that's, a, that's an amazing question and 
it's actually, it's, I, I just feel goosebumps around it because I, I can think about what we might do uh, over this week together to further get to that point. Thank you. And the, the introduction to, to conjugation as a way of thinking through different grammars of relation is right off the bat very exciting to me too. So thanks. Mm, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Uh, jo jo Johanna Bird. Hi, uh, sorry, just had to switch my camera. Um, chi miigwech for um, your introduction. It was so uh, lovely and um, yeah, so many things about it that I find so compelling, the, the relationship between law and land and story. Um, my question just has to do with, um, so in the history of, um, I guess we could talk about like attempts to include indigenous um, peoples in Canadian, Canadian law, um, you know, uh, in your efforts to um, think with your Anishinaabe legal traditions, um, how did you deal with, um, you know, just I'm, I'm thinking of stereotypes or um, kind of racist ideas that you must have come up against in trying to um, make your own case for um, why the work that you were doing was important. I'm just, I'd just be interested to hear about what your journey was like in that regard. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's probably a lot of different uh, um, dimensions to that. But one comes to mind is, is, is I try to put the shoe on the other foot sometimes. And as, as Christopher talked about irony and sarcasm might be a possibility just to get people to suddenly inhabit that space uh, where they are stereotyped or they do find themselves a bit adrift because it's not their uh, way of uh, maybe naturally proceeding. And so I, I'm just thinking of an, an instance when I was doing some work with the Canadian, uh, the Institute for the Administration of Canadian Justice or something like that. It was like 500 judges. And um, Maria Campbell uh, and uh, myself and Joseph Naitahau and maybe about 20 other Indigenous uh, lawyers and judges said, we need to help introduce Indigenous law to these judges. And so we were in the Hotel Besboro in the big uh, um, dining hall there. And uh, what we told was the first fart story. <laughs> and these judges were like, what is going on here? You could tell that they had no idea what was being presented as Joseph was playing his flute and acting like Nana Bojo and Maria Campbell was narrating this incredible story. They're, they're thinking, how, what, are we just being made fun of here as judges? Uh, of course, there was a bit of fun that was being made there, um, but we had a discussion afterwards. And it was interesting, all the, the Indigenous peoples, not all, but many Indigenous peoples that had been invited that weren't part of the planning group, they totally got where law was. And they were all just like, oh, 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 oh. And the judges just didn't have a thing to say about that. And they were, they could, now they could start to see as Indigenous peoples interpreted for them where the law was in that first fart story. Um, but it, would, it put the shoe on the other foot. And uh, they suddenly uh, recognized that there was something that was shared because people were talking from Quebec to Alberta, uh, having a relationship to that story. And they might've been Cree or Ojibwe or Blackfoot, but they, there was something of a similarity there. Not that there's a pan-indigeneity, but a, a methodology uh, was, was being shared and uh, it, was, it was exciting. And so sometimes uh, dealing with stereotypes and, uh, and misunderstandings that putting the shoe on the other foot, having a little bit of fun, laughing, even teasing, right? We were teasing obviously, but there was a seriousness underneath that because then they saw oh, we might not always be experts in what we're called upon to do here in passing law in relationship to this Indigenous community because there's other um, obligations that are going on that, uh, so there's a bit of humility, I think, that uh, started to set in as a result. So thanks for that question to give me an opportunity to share that story. Thank you. Um, it, it makes me think too of Dr. Bracken's comment at the beginning about anti-poetic prejudices racial prejudice, and I, I think those are connected somehow. Thank you. I think you're muted there, Chris. Christopher? Or 
Pardon me. Oh yeah, that's the first time I've done that. Um, so thanks for these great questions and the discussion is already fascinating. We originally planned this first meeting as one hour, I think as an introductory meeting. We don't wanna wear out our visitors on the first day. Um, and there's lots to come. Um, does anyone else have a question or comment? I think one last question or comment. Otherwise, um, I think we'll wrap for the day and look forward to tomorrow's symposium. So um, tomorrow's symposium will feature uh, Joshua Nichols and Darcy Lindbergh from the Faculty of Law, who are also, I believe, along with Hadley Friedland, your students, formerly, John. That's right. That's correct. And uh, I think we've agreed on a kind of conversational informal format for that event, which I'm looking forward to very much. So I think um, people are signing off and getting their thanks, a lot of thanks. So I think we'll wrap this event for today and thank John. You can applaud virtually if you want. If you like emojis, um, there's a few available on Zoom. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, everyone. So it's so good to be with you. I'm looking forward to our time together and hope you have a great evening. Yeah, thanks again. Take we'll care. Giga Thanks. Bye.